Well, you know, I don't have anything real profound today. Uh, which but you might say, well, you haven't for weeks. Aww. So what's the news today? But, you know, I just thought that, uh, you know, I said, I haven't got anything much profound. But I did discover some things in the scripture. Paul has some things that are very profound. And so does Peter. And so what we're going to do here for just a moment is we're just going to read some scripture together today. And, uh, and, and you, know, I'll, I'll, you know, you won't be able to keep me from adding some commentary to it. But uh, I'm maybe, maybe a little less commentary than usual. And maybe a little more of the uh, Pauline or, or of Peter's opinion than Mike's. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's, it's hard for me to let them control the scene sometimes. And that's the way it's... <laughs> anyway, if you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to read about four passages of Scripture here that, that certainly do relate to the, to the day that we are, have set aside to honor the resurrection of our Lord. But uh, let's just let the Scripture speak to us for a little bit this morning. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. But I, I delivered to you, first of all, now he's declaring to us the gospel that he preached. I think this is very important for us to understand this. So many things get brought into, you know, our understanding of the gospel. And most of those things are, in fact, derivatives of the gospel. They're, many of the things that we teach here are not primary to the gospel, but they are derivatives of this wonderful gospel. In other words, even the things that I've been teaching, can you hear me now? Some of these things, the, 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 they, they grow up out of, they originate in the gospel, the fact that the Father speaks to you and is intimate with you in conversation. See, that's not the gospel, but that is a derivative of the gospel. Isn't that that's good news, right? Okay, and that's what I'm talking about. There's so many things that we teach around here, that I teach around here, that are derivatives of the gospel, but we need to sometimes, uh, regularly, come right back to the realization of what the gospel is. This is the gospel, he said, that I preached. Wherever I went, this is what I preached. Okay? He said, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel that Paul preached. That Christ died for our sins. That he was buried. That he rose again on the third day. That's the gospel. And as I said, there are many derivatives but one gospel. And that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. And now Paul takes a few moments to establish, you know, the, uh, the testimony of others. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, and then by the apostle, all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. And then if you'll just jump down to verse 11. Therefore, whether it was I who saw him or they, so we preach and so you believe. So now he says, this is the gospel we preach. That Christ died for our sins. That he was buried. And that he was resurrected, raised again on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, if Christ is preached that he has not been, that he has that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. In other words, what are you doing here? Yes, and we, found, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. 
Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now notice how Paul is now beginning to bring the resurrection of Christ into conjunction with the resurrection of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Now let me just say this commentary on verse 23. Actually, this ought probably better to be translated with the word these than those. Those that are who are Christ, these who are Christ. And referring back to the previous verses where he said, those who have fallen asleep. And then when he said also in verse 22, all shall be made alive. This is what he's referring to with the these. He's not referring to some Western evangelical, you know, expression of those who have become Christ's through the proper channels, through the proper repentance and confession and so on and so forth. He's saying these that I have before mentioned. He said the Christ is the first one. This is speaking of the order of the resurrection. He's saying Christ, the first fruits, first Christ he says, he uses the word order, each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, these that he has just referred to, these who have fallen asleep in Christ, these all, these all, got to get that, see? These all who are Christ at his coming. And then if you go with me down to, or I mean over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 1, for we know, and we're going to read this as though he had just spoken this right after the words we just finished in 1 Corinthians 15. For we know that if our early, our early earthly house, this tent is destroyed or perishes, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, not because we want to simply be unembodied spirits floating around in the heavenlies, which is what some people would, would say, okay? But further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing. What does that mean? He who has prepared us to be further clothed, that mortality be swallowed up in life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. And then just over to the 14th and 15th verse, with most of you can quote. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And then if we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, see, a whole lot of this is stuff you've only hear at funerals. And yet Paul says, I'm declaring to you the gospel which I preach. And then later on in that 15th chapter, he said, he said in, in effect, I'm declaring to you the gospel which we, those who have witnessed the resurrection of Christ, preach. And so here we only give opportunity to this at funerals, but this ought to be the gospel that is preached on a regular basis. This ought to be the foundational understanding of all of the derivatives that we expound on for our good, for our well-being. Okay. And he says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Remember, that was part of the gospel 
in 1 Corinthians 15. The revelation, the connection between the resurrection of Jesus and those who had fallen asleep. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, according to 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel that he preached, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. And there is no validity in there for a rapture doctrine, by the way, but I'm not going to get into that right now. I just want you to understand this is the gospel that Paul preached. Isn't that interesting how you and I found our way into the gospel? We didn't have to force our way into the gospel. We were sucked into the gospel. Isn't that amazing when you think about that? We're not trying to make it about us. He made it about us. He made it about who? All. Right? As all died in Adam, all shall be made alive, he said. And when he said all shall be made alive, at that point in time, what was he talking about? He was talking about the promised resurrection. Okay? All right? So... Anyway, and then over in John, because we might as well go ahead and include a little bit of him who is the gospel, right? Not let Paul have the whole stage like we so often do errantly. All right, in John 11, you know this. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then Jesus said this, do you believe this? And so this is what I'm asking us today. Do we believe this? This gospel that we have just read about, this gospel that we could have just understood to be the gospel that Paul preached and that, the, and that those giving testimony or bearing firsthand testimony or witness to his resurrection, the James, the Cephas, the, the others of his apostles, this was the gospel they preached. And that gospel always included we. It was not just he. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. See? And that's wonderful, wonderful news. But not until we fully connect it with the reason for the resurrection. Hear what I'm saying? It must be fully connected. It's just not a he's alive. It's a we're alive. Isn't that right? I mean, what does Paul tell us in Romans 6? That we died with him, we were buried with him, we were made alive with him, and we were raised with him, and in Ephesians, we were seated with him, right? So we got to always make this connection. This is stuff you all know. I know it is. Anyway, so Jesus says, do you believe this? Well, what is he asking? Well, do you believe that, we'll use Paul's words, that all shall be made alive? I think it's important because not everybody in the Christian church believes that, right? That all shall be made alive. Do you believe in the resurrection of those who have fallen asleep, of all of those who have fallen asleep? Not just Aunt Matilda who had, attended church regularly and so on and so forth, right? Okay. And what is it? Now, we've been focusing on the resurrection of the last day, as Martha called it, in the last day. So what is it that makes this resurrection a certainty? Well, I want you to go with me over to 1 Peter chapter, uh, chapter 1. And boy, have you been here a, long, a lot if you've been around this church. 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 3, <clears throat> I know most people have their, well, certainly in Jesus first and foremost, but most people have their indoctrination or the initiation of, of, of this Christian message, of this true message of the gospel through Jesus, certainly, but then primarily through Paul. But, but Peter spoke to me first, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway... 1 Peter 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who according to his abundant mercy, not according to your abundant obedience or response or confession or repentance, has begotten us again to a living hope or a life of confident expectation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, and I'm, I'm really grateful. Years ago, when Marilyn and I first went off to Bible college, I'd be, all I'd ever, I, I had no Bible that I was really that familiar with. And my brother, who had preceded me at, at the Bible school where I was going, I said, you know, what, what Bible should I get when I'm going here? And he said, he said, I would suggest that even though they preach out of the King James, that you get the New American Standard Bible. He said, I think it'll really help you. Well, it did. I'm glad I listened to him. And, um, and so this 1 Peter 1.3 spoke to me first and foremost out of the New, New American Standard Bible. So let me read it to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, has caused us. You've heard me say this. I've quoted this a million times. Has caused us to be born again or born from the first. Remember, we've talked about this before. The terminology born again. Except humanity is born again, he, mankind, cannot see the kingdom of God. We talked about that a long time ago. But anyway, when it says except a man, it's not just talking about the individual man. It's talking about universal man. Except man, right? Be born again. But the word means born from above, born from the first. And this is really important, born from the first. So the first thing Peter says to us here is... Through his abundant or great mercy, he has caused us to be born from the first. Now, this is important because this is both a relational and a historical locator for us. Because first of all, the first would, re would refer to, uh, relationally to us, to him who is the first. Him who calls himself, identifies himself in Revelation 1, 11, and 17 as the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, Right? And so, first of all, we're being told here by both Jesus in John chapter 3 and by Peter here that he has caused us to be born from the first. As my children were born from my wife, we were born from the first. So that's, first of all, a relational indicator of what? In Christ. But it's also a historical locator because it refers to before time began, the first before there was an Adamic creation. You see, all paths, isn't it interesting how all the paths that we keep following around here seem to lead us back to 2 Timothy 1, 9, and 10, to the God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us what? In Christ, before time began. And you see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're told here, caused us, through that, the Father caused us to be born from the first, to be born once again from where we originated, to be born by an act from above, not from here on earth among men, but an act that was from above, reuniting us with the first, who was the first and is the last, right? Okay. So it's important. But then he goes on, he says that, who has caused us to be born again, or born from the first, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Again, not through our confession, not through our repentance, not through our belief. Now, let me say this. I am a huge believer in believing. You know that. <laughs> Because I understand that the greatest benefit is derived by those who believe. 1 Timothy 4.10, Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men, and especially of those who believe, or the greatest benefit is derived by those who believe, is what that means. And it has been a much greater benefit to me to have believed than to have not believed all these years. Isn't that right? It's not a greater benefit off in eternity, but it's a greater benefit now. 
It has benefited me. It has benefited my wife. It has benefited my children. I mean, there is a great benefit. So when, but, but we need to understand that he has not caused us to be born again through our belief, but through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Isn't that right? That's the gospel that Paul preached. That's the gospel that Cephas and James and those that he mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 preached. And that's why Paul immediately brought it together in that 15th chapter, this resurrected, this resurrected experience of Jesus with, the, with the, 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 the actual resurrection of humanity that was off in the future, right? All shall be made alive, okay? All right, so anyway... <clears throat> But again, and I want to say this, this passage in Peter, because of that, my exposure, I mean, it is plain in the New King James too, but, but because I had a bit of a, of a Western evangelical Christianity influence in my life, even though I grew up in a grace-filled home, <clears throat> because I had that, this passage in, in, out of the New American Standard, you know, was my introduction to inclusion, Many, many years ago, I began to sense inclusion back in 1977 when I first got this new American Standard Bible. It was my awakening to inclusion. Along with, then of course, or in conjunction with 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 that we just read, you know, that uh, we, we judge thus, uh, thusly that if one died for all, then all died and one did die for and so on. That th those two passages of Scripture going back to 1977 and 78 were the things that began to, they, were my, they, they created my first step or initiated my first step out of eternal conscious torment, too. Beginning to realize the all-inclusive, all-God-accomplished work of the cross and the resurrection. And so this is what we want to understand in the, in the gospel. Now, using Peter, let's go back over to Acts chapter 3. And it's interesting because, you know, you can see in Peter an awful lot of his ongoing connection with his old Jude Judean life. I mean, his old uh, life as a Jew. I mean, there, there's things, you know, that, that are... That are said or, or seen in the, in the Gospels. You know, this is great, Jesus. We're going to build three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. See, that's his old covenant coming out, right? And I think maybe it took Peter a while, like it does us, to come to his senses. But man, he has come to his senses now. Listen to him preach in, in um, Acts chapter 2. I'm just going to look at a couple of verses. Or Acts chapter 3, I'm sorry. Verse 25. <clears throat> He says, you are the sons of the prophets. And of course, remember, the gospel was what? To the Jew first and then also to the Greek. So he's preaching right here primarily to, this, to his Jewish brothers and sisters. But he said, you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham. Now listen to him. In your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Big old earth. Great deal of history lying before Abraham and his seed and humanity from the day this was spoken, right? All the families to come on the earth, all the families that now exist on the earth. He said, but in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, the Jew, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from, his, from your iniquities. So here's the thing. Because what we're trying to do again right now is in support of 1 Peter 1, 3, I want to help us understand Peter's perspective. And here, I think we can almost be certain that this message that Peter is preaching here as recorded in Acts 3 is being spoken sometime before the writing of 1 Peter 1, 3. I think that's probably a pretty safe guess on our part. He probably hadn't written 1 Peter by the time we get here shortly after the day of Pentecost. You know what I'm saying? So he has an early perspective. And that early perspective is tied to his, his understanding of, of, of God's relationship with Abraham. So he sees something that has already, as he gets started, eliminated an exclusion filter. 
Now we know a little bit later on if it's chron if it's chronologically correct. A little little little, little later on. <laughs> In Acts, we find him, you know, on the rooftop being told by God, what I've cleansed, let no man call unclean, right? And he's struggling a little bit there with whether or not he should eat the things that have been lowered in the sheet, you know? And he, and he, and he understands, and as he goes on and talks to Cornelius' household, he understands, though, that, that you know, that he had, made a, he had made a distinction between the Jew and the Greek. He had had a bit of an exclusionistic filter but here in the beginning, see, he's, he's done like, doing like a lot of us do. He's preaching stuff that really hadn't fully dawned on him yet. I do that all the time. You know, I preach stuff and then later on it dawns on me. But the words of my own mouth come back and haunt me almost with, with, with some later action that doesn't line up with what I said out of my mouth, right? But here Peter has an interesting perspective because he's, his perspective is what? All the families of the earth. And so after citing, first of all, after citing, you know, God's words to Abraham that in you shall all the, in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. He goes on then in the 25th verse, basically, and he, 26th verse, I mean, he goes on and, and explains how this came about. He said, having raised up, okay, having raised up, same word as resurrection, having raised up, having resurrected, his servant Jesus sent him. Now listen to this literally, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him blessing you. Now, when he says blessing you, based on verse 25, who's he talking about? Just the Jew? No, all the families of the earth. That's why it's important to understand his perspective from verse 25 before we read verse 26. His perspective, his understanding is that all the families of the earth... He said, having raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him blessing all the families of the earth. And he says, in the turning away of every one of you from your iniquities. Now, this Greek word that's translated here as turning away is a word that means this. It means to remove anything from anyone. Now, I want you to understand what that's saying. That is referring to a work done by the first party, not by the second party. In other words, we would say, turn from your sin, and we would be talking to you, the second party, to make the turn. But what he's saying here is, he sent his servant Jesus blessing you, blessing all the families of the earth, turning them away from their iniquities. In other words, all of this turning away, all of this removing of something from someone was accomplished by Jesus, not by the second party, but by the first party, yeah. right? And what was, so who did it all? Jesus did it all. Jesus did all the turning away. It wasn't a turning away. It wasn't a repentance again by humanity. It was a turning away that was fully initiated and affected, accomplished by Jesus himself, his servant Jesus, having sent his servant Jesus, okay? And then, <clears throat> So here again, we have, and this is iniquities. Now we have John's testimony, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the singular sin, the sin of the world. And now we have Peter's testimony that Jesus was sent turning away, stripping humanity of their association with iniquities. That's a pretty strong statement. He did it all. Didn't have anything to do with man. Had everything to do with Jesus in his resurrection, right? And then, as I said, it's important that we understand that it more literally says, sent him blessing. Now, this new King James said, sent him to bless. But to bless is weak. And the reason it's weak is because anytime we say he was sent to bless, that provides access to if you. Doesn't it? But if it sent him blessing, he was already in the act of blessing. There was already blessing taking place as he was sent. It wasn't a, I'm here to bless you. What would you like? What do you do to get it? See what I'm saying? So send blessing, send him blessing, right? So here's the thing. Peter sees all the families of the earth having had the same benefits conferred upon them. That's what the word blessing means, to confer benefits upon. 
So Jesus, Peter sees all the families of the earth, right? All right, so we went back there for a reason. So consequently then, in 1 Peter 1, 3, because again, even though we can see that it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has caused us to be born again. Well, that us can be us churchgoers, us faithful Christian people, right? But now we understand that Peter had a perspective that when he spoke in 1 Peter 1, 3, now we understand that his perspective was <laughs> that all the families of the earth were caused to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Does that make sense to you? They were all caused to be born from the first. They were all caused to be born into Paul's 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10 revelation. Okay. <clears throat> I want you to go with me just over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins. So it would, it would seem here then, wouldn't it, that Peter had the same understanding of the just for the unjust as, as Paul had in 2 Corinthians 5. One died for all, therefore all died. For Christ also suffered once for the sins, the, for sins, the just, which was him, for the unjust, which would be all of the remainder of humanity, right? For the unjust. That he, not our confession, not our obedience, not our rep repentance, might bring us to God. That he might bring us to God. Doesn't it amaze you sometimes how clear it's been all along? As we tried to read through the mud. It's crystal clear while we were trying to, yeah, Okay that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Great revival. Great revival. Eight souls were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right, now, so verse 18 again. Once for sins, the just, that's him, for the unjust, that's all, all right? That's all the families of the world, of the earth. Remember, that's Peter's perspective. That's how Peter sees things now. He's already told us in verse 3 of chapter 1 that all the families of the earth have been caused to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And now he says something here. He, he tells us again that for, the, for all, for all the families, that he might bring us that same unjust all to God. Not us church folks. Okay, but the same unjust all, right? And then Peter tells us, goes on here and, and tells us a little bit about the ministry of mercy that Jesus undertook as he went and preached to the spirits in prison. That was a ministry of mercy, right? That's what, okay. Who was he speaking to? He was preaching to the unjust of Noah's moment, according to what Peter said here, right? All right. And then... <clears throat> And then finally, he points out, and this is what I want, to get, want you to see here. Finally, he points out that through Noah's waters, I'm going to call them Noah's waters, only a few were saved, right? There were just a few that were saved through Noah's waters. Hmm, all right? Listen, he's setting the stage for something big here. Then he does something after he says that only a few, that is eight souls, were saved through Noah's waters. Then he does something here that the Western evangelical Christian exclusionists have totally missed, right? He says, now listen to me carefully. He says there is an antitopos 
that's the Greek word, that now saves us, baptism, which we're going to refer to as the waters of Christ, if you'll allow me to do that now, okay? Because we, we, we're going to make a distinction, and you'll see why in just a moment. He said, if you were saved through the waters of Noah, but there is an antipas, okay? Now, some versions use the word corresponding to, saying baptism corresponds to this, or they use like figure, all right? And these are both valid interpretations of this Greek word, but they're very misleading, all right? Because the word antitopos is a word that means corresponding but contrasting, see? And so it's properly rendered in the New King James as an anti-type, not a type, but an anti-type, a contrasting type, something differing from what the other did. You seen that? So this New King James is correct. In fact, that's the transliteration of the word. It's A-N-T-E-T-U-P-O-S in the Greek. And the transliteration of that into English is antitype. So it's not a type, it's an antitype. Baptism that he's talking about here is not a type of the floods of Noah, of the waters of Noah, okay? So it's a word that means contrasting, right? So in other words... Peter is saying this. Peter is saying that the waters of Noah and the waters of Christ are to be compared to one another, but in contrast, not in sameness. Okay? All right? But now listen to me carefully for a second. <clears throat> and I want you to ignore that which is parenthetical in, in this passage of Scripture. Is that the right word, parenthetical, when something's in brackets? But it, whatever. I want you to ignore this part where he says, uh, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Ignore that for a moment. So that we can just read the sentence like this. There is an, also an antitype which now saves us, baptism through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because that's what the statement says with this little parenthetical addition to it. Okay? Which I'm not saying is unimportant, but we need to set it aside momentarily so it won't confuse us, right? But anyway. So here... Listen to me again carefully, because the greater point that Peter is making here, okay, <clears throat> is that, listen to me carefully, is that not a few, but all were saved through the resurrection of Christ. He makes this point that only a few were saved through, this, through Noah's waters. But the point he's making here is that not a few, but all. Because he has started this off again in verse 18. Well, I hadn't started there, but we picked it up there. That Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, which is all, right? And so now he's saying, through the waters of Noah, there were a few who were saved. But you must understand there is an antitype to this. There is something that stands in contrast to this minimal salvation that we see recorded in the waters of Noah, eight people. There is a strong antitype, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the salvation of all, see? Okay. <clears throat> and he's saying here that all were saved through the resurrection, both those whom Peter went and preached to in prison and then the accumulated unjust of humanity going forward. You know, Ephesians 4, 8, maybe I don't remember where it is, but it talks about how he led forth a host of captives or he led captivity captive, depending on the version you're in. And it refers about who is he ascended, but he who descended and he who descended, you know, and then he goes on and says, led forth a host of captives or led captivity captive. So when he descended, Peter tells us when he descended, what he did was he went and preached to the spirits who were in prison, who were one time disobedient in the days of Noah, right? And so Paul tells us an addendum to that, that when he left, they left with him. Now, I want to read something to you, uh, if you'll allow me. Maybe some of you got to had the privilege of seeing this already this morning, um, Did any of you happen to see uh, Brad Jersick's thing this morning from the Gospel of Nicodemus? 
Well, Brad, Brad put this on. Brad puts a lot of interesting things on. I, you know, this is from the Gospel of Nicodemus, which we, of course, don't have in our Bible. But never. <clears throat> this is the quote from there. Hades, receiving Satan, said to him, Turn and see that not one of the dead has been left in me. But all that thou hast gained through the tree of knowledge, all hast thou lost through the tree of the cross. While Hades was... <laughs> While Hades was thus discoursing with Satan, the king of glory stretched out his right hand and took hold of our forefather Adam and raised him. Then turning also to the rest, he said, come all with me, as many as have died through the tree which he touched. For behold, I again raise you up through the tree of the cross. Thereupon he brought them all out and he took them and sprang up out of Hades. Now, this is the gospel of Nicodemus. Whether you, you know, value some of the writings that haven't quite made it into our holy infallible book. But that powerful. Yeah. I thought it was timely, Brad. I appreciate you putting that on this morning. Didn't know where I was going with the next thing. <laughs> no, but anyway. So as I said, so he goes on and he... <clears throat> And he, he's, the implication here of Peter is that not, not a few were saved, but all were saved through the resurrection of Christ. Referring back to those to whom he preached, which I've already said, Paul said he led forth captivity captive, right? Okay. And then also, but, but Mike, didn't he say it's baptism that saves us? Of course, this has been an ongoing thing with certain sects of Christianity for, you know, you can't be saved unless you're water baptized and so on and so forth. But as I said, let's read it the way it's written, first of all, baptism through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a couple of ways you can look at that, obviously. Now, we know that Peter and Paul and all these fellows, they practiced water baptism. But why did they practice water baptism? To get people saved? No, Paul said no. That would empty the cross of its power, right? That would empty the cross. But they did preach it and they did practice it. And there was a reason for practicing it, right? A reason for, you know, for bringing it. So, <clears throat> but so he said, he said, um, which now saves us, baptism through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing we need to understand. Baptism, like communion, in its purity, which maybe we don't even know anymore. I don't know. But let's go back to this early church and their concept of baptism and, and the Lord's Supper and so on and so forth. What it is, is it's a, it's a response to and a reflection of a reality that has been grasped by an individual. You understand what I'm saying? Baptism was not something they did to get saved. Baptism was a, a response to the reality that they had grasped onto, that they had been saved by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Does that make sense? And same with the Lord's Supper. And so Peter can put these two together without confusing us, but we're confused today because, you see, for the most part, water baptism in Western evangelical Christianity has become the practice of the waters of Noah through whom some are presumed to be saved. You know what I'm saying? So that's what water baptism has become in many of our, you know, modern churches. It's nothing more than the practice of the waters of Noah. Some get saved through it and some lose it, right? But anyway, so again, we need to understand that to this early church, there was an equivalence, if you will. I guess that's the right word, you know. That, <clears throat> that, that existed between the two. The waters of Christ were the acknowledgement of having been saved through the resurrection. Okay, that makes sense to you? Okay. You know, Paul's statement that we've already read over in, in 2 Corinthians you know, 5, 14, and 15, that we, we judge thusly that if one died for all, then all died, and one did die for all, and so on. Okay. So that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Well, you know, Paul's, Paul's made a statement there that in 2 Corinthians 5 had no attachment whatsoever to the concept of baptism. But you read the exact same thing. Uh, I've already alluded to it this morning in Romans chapter 6. In verse 3, he says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also walk in newness of life. So once again, I mean, see, Paul's done the same thing twice. He's doing the same, same thing in two different passages of Scripture that Peter did in one. Peter brought baptism and the resurrection of Jesus Christ together. Understanding, as Paul did, that one was just a response to the reality grasped. Because Paul said, you know that as many of us as were baptized, or the Greek actually says something more like as much as we were. Not as many, but as much as we were. So it's not as about a many people, it's, a, it's about what happened. As much as we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death. All Paul is doing is bringing the, bringing the reality to them of what, they to, what took place when they were baptized. You understand what I'm saying? So it's not baptism that saves us. It's the reality that saves us, right? It's the reality that saved us. And he did all the reality, right? So in other words, and then Peter does say this, going back to that parenthetical expression that I told you to uh, Forget for a moment. <clears throat> Peter says that the response of baptism to the reality of the resurrection is in the New King James. I went through a bunch of them, and the New King James has it best. Okay? He says that the response of baptism to the reality of the resurrection is the answer of a good conscience towards God. Not a plea for, as some say, not, you know, but the answer of a good conscience. In other words, to conclude, it's this. The resurrection says your sin has been taken away. The resurrection says <laughs> he has turned away all your iniquities from you. The resurrection says there is no longer any need or any reason for you to have consciousness of sins. That your conscience is clear. Baptism says, Amen. Get it? It's all baptism does is agrees, right? Baptism says, amen, all shall be made alive. So to quote Jesus, do you believe this? Do you believe he is risen? Do you believe we are risen? Do you believe we are all prepared for mortality to be swallowed up by life? Do you believe we shall all be raised? Because that's the gospel that Paul preached. That's the gospel that was preached by the apostles. You get anything out of that? Happy Easter. <laughs> and it wasn't anything profound. It was right there on the page. Amen. Right there in black and white. Yeah, it's just plain as a nose on our face. No, anyway. Father, we just love you so much. We're so grateful, Father, that you just took upon yourself the entirety of what we have called the human problem, and you just fixed it all in one swoop. Thank you, Lord, that you never really saw a problem, that you saw, Father, a child, children, in a bit of despair because we thought. But, Father, your thoughts have changed our thoughts. Your not our thoughts are not our thoughts. I thank you, Lord, that this message of, of your acceptance of all of mankind continues to spread like wildfire around this globe, that this message of inclusion finally becomes the message that is accepted by humanity worldwide, Father. No longer discounted by the church, no longer called heretical by the very people that you've saved. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you, that you consecrated yourself to become in our behalf. We love you. We're grateful in your name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, I know that you want to know if we're going to get back to... Can you hear me now next week? Oh, yeah.